The West didn't raise you right because you don't matter to the West. They don't care if you have knowledge. They don't care if you have an education. They'll pass you on up to the next grade, whether or not you can read or write, because you don't matter. Every day of your life, your civilization all around you is shouting at you in a million different voices that you don't matter. You're just a replaceable cog in the machine. Everyone in the West is regarded as disposable by the West, and still you defend it as the pinnacle of human refinement. You need to break that spell because you're living in a trance, a trance of uh, propaganda that's all designed to keep you oblivious to your own humiliation. You have been duped. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived. Yes, you, well-meaning person watching this video. You were duped into believing in American propaganda. Maybe you've had this realization already and prior to October 7th. But if you are one of the many Americans who are realizing the depravity and the sociopathic drive in our country, I say welcome. You aren't crazy. You aren't alone. Make sure to stay hydrated and get enough sleep. Also, none of this means that you're stupid. None of this means that you're willingly participating. It just means that the propaganda was working. There's so many amazing voices out there right now amplifying the Palestinian liberation message as well as anarchism and Marxism in general. But this video in particular is going to be about propaganda and the malicious intent of cloudy language in American politics to misinform and to deter us as a populace. I think I will leave the on the ground details to those who teach us all and stick to what I know, and that's blabbering on about theory. Most of my videos are long form that take me a few weeks at a time to create, but with the genocide continuing on after two months of escalation, at the time of me writing and recording this, there's no better time than the present. We must stay armed in our minds. You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right? nigga with a library card. It's hard for most Americans to recognize that we are also being propagandized <laughs> because we are under the illusion of consent and freedom of choice. I saw a tweet the other day that shared that while Zionist propaganda looks rightfully cheap, lazy, and outlandish to the rest of us, Americans need to recognize that that's how we look to the rest of the world. What? <laughs> Bro, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> I knew that in a literal sense, but reading that gave me a sobering chill down my back. In my America has a fascism problem series, we discussed that America has been heading towards authoritarianism for decades, and that it's not just something that occurred on January 6th or in 2016. Similarly, Palestine has not been suffering since October 7th, but for 75 years. We have either been lulled into silence or completely hidden from the truth in both cases. That is control and coercion. That is propaganda. For a quick refresher of the definition, propaganda refers to the information, ideas, or rumors spread to the intent to promote or particular cause or point of view, often but not always with a biased or misleading nature. The term itself is neutral and can be applied to communication efforts by any government, organization, or group. For instance, I would consider myself a propagandist. I'm actively shaping information to influence my audience to become more community oriented more radical in their personal politics, and more open-minded. American propaganda, however, refers to the dissemination of information with the purpose of influencing public opinion, attitudes, or behavior in favor of certain ideals or objectives associated with the United States and their allies. For many people, the idea that propaganda is used by democratic rather than merely authoritarian governments will be a strange one. Well, uh, the term propaganda fell into disfavor at the t uh, around the Second World War, but in the 1920s and the 1930s, it was commonly used and in fact advocated uh, not by leading intellectuals, by the founders of modern political science, by uh, Wilsonian progressives, and of course by the public relations industry as a necessary technique uh, to overcome the danger of democracy. So that means if America is aligned with white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, then the propaganda, no matter how diversified or anti-authoritarian it may seem, is always aligned with fascism. 
Propaganda is the reason why many of us, myself included, are only now discovering how corrupt and fascist Israel is, and by proxy, America is, because of the billions and billions in financial support, as well as Joe Biden's blatant arrogance and disregard for the overwhelming public support for a ceasefire in an unoccupied Palestine. Joe Biden himself calls himself a Zionist with bold impunity, unapologetic with what that declaration truly means for people who understand the power of words and semantics. I saw Toni Morrison's Netflix documentary last night, and in it, she shared the first time words showed their power to her in a real way as a child. Her and her childhood friend were copying graffiti they saw in a neighborhood on the ground to practice writing around the age of six and started to write out the F word. Her mom never told her what the word was or why it was bad, but immediately erased it and told him to come inside. I share that anecdote to say, words have power to anger people. Words have power to change people. Words have power to love and hate, to build and destroy. Words mean things. Though many people use their love for words as a means to put others down, I truly am writing this essay because I want people to understand the dire importance of them. So that way we are more intentional about what we say and how we say it, but more importantly, how we listen. When you say that it's the job of evil to keep you from doing your work, we have to keep doing the work through the dark time. An artist, certainly, uh, and other people as well, in all different walks, all different kinds of professions, labor, relationships. What happened to me was I was like, oh. I mean, little did I know how it would turn out later, but at the time, I thought, like, this is impossible, this election. You can guess which one it was. And I thought, oh. And, okay, so I thought, oh, this is terrible. But what I knew was that I was not going down, you know, I get up early in the morning to write because I'm very smart early in the morning. Right now, it's about over. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't. And so Peter called me up. It was Christmas. And he usually says, hi, how you doing? So this time he called me up. And he said, how you doing? I said, uh, I don't know, Peter. I said, I feel so tired. I was writing and I can't write. And I was talking about what had happened uh, politically that had made me so, uh, as you say, paralyzed or not doing it or not thinking about it. And he started screaming, no, 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 no. This is the time when artists go to work, not when everything is all right, not when it looks sunny, it's when it's hard. And I thought, about all those people who wrote in prisons, in gulags, under duress, got mur I mean, you know, they were doing it. So I'm sitting here going, uh, I can't write. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> and, but you know, you need sometimes, somebody just shake you and you realize that you're there. So it's just more interesting to me the complicated, sophisticated, creative ways in which people do good things. They're interesting to me. Anybody can chop off somebody's head. <laughs> Where's the imagination in that? You know, you uh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Not doing it. I wasn't doing it when I was reading the comics back in 1938. It wasn't interesting then either. But this other is, and I don't know why it doesn't absolutely grab people, not in a narcissistic way, but just into, as something that one can inquire about as well as execute. Throughout history, various forms of propaganda have been employed by the U.S. government, especially during times of war or conflict. This can include posters, films, speeches, and other media designed to shape public perception and garner support for particular policies or actions. 
During World War I and World War II, for example, the U.S. government used propaganda to encourage patriotism, boost morale, and promote specific war-related efforts. That's the image most people are familiar with, the rosy riveters of it all. In our modern world, however, America influences mass media and news outlets to spread misinformation based on their political and global goals. We can't mention this without the most recent example of Joe Biden falsely claiming on international television with no evidence that the Palestinian-led defense, Hamas, was burning babies alive and beheading them. They did not walk that back at all after being corrected by multiple news outlets as well as the Israeli government themselves because they didn't have to. The image of the beheaded children was already in the masses' minds and their plan of redirection and fear work. That's propaganda. Words mean things. Why did you say twice? I heard you the first time, dumbass. I want to speak specifically about the war on terror for a moment and how the parallels are very apparent as a millennial who went through this before and is getting the worst kind of deja vu. In the aftermath of 9-11, the US government used propaganda to build support for the war on terror. This included media campaigns, speeches, and visual imagery emphasizing the need to combat terrorism to protect American values and security. The main talking point of the time was WMDs or weapons of mass destruction. I take the threat very seriously. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction very seriously. The American government and George Bush repeated WMDs every time they came on television or across our airwaves and solidified the idea that all of Afghanistan had to be investigated on the ground because of this. I cannot tell you everything that we know, but what I can share with you when combined with what all of us have learned over the years is deeply troubling. What you will see is an accumulation of facts and disturbing patterns of behavior. The facts in Iraqi's behavior, Iraq's behavior, demonstrate that Saddam Hussein and his regime have made no effort, no effort, to disarm as required by the international community. Indeed, the facts and Iraq's behavior show that Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. They use the horror and fear that the Americans had during 9-11 to manufacture our consent into a 20-plus year war. Being a kid around this time and being brainy enough to watch the news with my family, it was quite terrifying. They kept showcasing and highlighting the warships and all of the soldiers deploying, really gearing up for a big event. They made it feel like we were going to have on the ground attacks in America. That constant fear allowed people to give over their rights via the Patriot Act and to blindly follow whatever was presented to them. They manufactured our consent. Manufactured consent is a concept that refers to the idea that public opinion and consensus are not naturally occurring phenomena, but are often intentionally shaped and manipulated by powerful institutions such as the government and mass media. The term was popularized by political scientist and linguist Noam Chomsky and co-author Edward S. Herman in their 1988 book, Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media. You write in Manufacturing Consent that it's the primary function of the mass media in the United States to mobilize public support for the special interests that dominate the government and the private sector. What are those interests? Well, if you want to understand the way any society works, ours or any other, uh, the first place to look is who makes, who is in a position to make the decisions that determine the way the society functions. The central argument is that mass media, despite its apparent diversity and freedom, serves the interests of the powerful elite by framing and controlling the narrative in a way that aligns with their agenda. It's not about what we see in this case but what they want to tell us. Chomsky and Herman identified a propaganda model in which media outlets driven by economic and political forces end up shaping public opinion in ways that benefit those in power. Here's the breakdown of the propaganda model. The media is often owned by large corporations or individuals with specific interests. This ownership can influence the selection and presentation of news stories. The institutional structure of the media is quite straightforward. We're talking about the United States, but it's not very different elsewhere. The, uh, the major, there, there are sectors, but the agenda-setting media, the ones that sort of set the framework for everyone else, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on, uh, these are major corporations, parts of even bigger conglomerates, like other Inst corporate institutions, they have a product with, and a market. 
Uh, their market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. Their product is privileged, relatively privileged audiences, more or so less. They're, they're selling audiences. To they're selling privileged audience. These are big business, big corporations selling privileged audiences to other corporations. Now the question is, what would a ra what picture of the world would a rational person expect to come out of this structure? And then we draw some conclusions about what you'd expect, and then we check. And yes, that's the picture of the world that comes out. I'm sure, you notice the differences between how mainstream media have been reporting on Palestinians versus the Israeli government. The most glaring example is the Israel Hamas war label. To frame it this way is to justify their action. So we all know and see that it is a genocide. Next, media outlets depend on advertising revenue, and advertisers may have certain expectations or preferences. This economic dependence can influence content and coverage. It is not a conspiracy to question, for example, the timing of the ceasefire in Gaza during an American holiday that is historically known for billions of dollars in revenue for both advertisers and corporations. They thought that we could be lulled back to sleep with 10% off. Uh, and uh, advertising is... Uh... I mean, it, it's part of a much bigger industry. It's just, advertising is part of the public relations industry. It's a huge industry. And it developed uh, very consciously around the First World War uh, in the two most democratic countries, uh, the United, England and the United States. And there's a good reason for it. Uh, they were coming to under, as the countries were becoming more free, that just through popular struggle and people were winning the franchise and you couldn't shut them up anymore by force, it became, it was understood that you're going to have to control people by controlling opinion and attitudes because we can't rely on force anymore. And is this anything more than the idea that basically the press is relatively right wing with some exceptions because it's owned by big business, which is a truism, mm -hmm. is well known? Well, I would call the press relatively liberal. Here I agree with the right wing critics. Uh, so especially the New York Times and the Washington Post, and which are called, <clears throat> without a trace of irony, the New York Times is called the establishment left in, say, major foreign policy journals. And that's correct, but what's not recognized is that the role of the liberal intellectual establishment is to set very sharp bounds on how far you can go, this far and no further. Give me some examples of that. Well, let's take, say, the Vietnam War, the probably the leading critic, and in fact one of the leading dissident intellectuals in the mainstream is Anthony Lewis of the New York Times, who did finally come around to opposing the Vietnam War about 1969, about a year and a half after corporate America had more or less ordered Washington to call it off. Uh, and his picture from then on is that the war, as he put it, began with blundering efforts to do good, but it ended up <clears throat> by 1969 being a disaster and costing us too much. So what would, well, the non the criticism. what would the non-propaganda model have told Americans about the Vietnam War at the same time? Same thing that the mainstream press was telling them about Afghanistan. The United States invaded South... had, first of all, in the 1950s, had set up a standard Latin American-style terror state which had massacred tens of thousands of people, but was unable to, main to control local a local uh, uprising, and everyone knows, at least every specialist knows that's what it was. And when Kennedy came in in 1961, they had to make a decision because the government was collapsing under local attack, so the U.S. just invaded the country. In 1961, the U.S. Air Force started bombing South Vietnamese civilians, authorized napalm, crop destruction. Then in 1965, January, February 1965, uh, the next major escalation took place against South Vietnam, not against North Vietnam. That was a sideshow. That's what the, an honest press would be saying, but you can't find a trace of it. They thought wrong, obviously. We see this with Starbucks' increasing desperation with each 50% off sale and free drink and having to shut down every single location in Morocco. Shout out to Morocco, they stand on business. With McDonald's also bringing back the snack wrap after ignoring people for like six years too. I'm a vegan, so I don't shop at these places anymore anyway, but it has been pretty hilarious seeing their peacocking attempts. Next, 
journalists often rely on official sources such as government statements and press releases. This reliance can lead to a narrow range of perspectives being presented and critical voices may be marginalized. The journalists are getting their talking points directly from the White House who clearly support the genocide and Israel. So when they get on CNN and MSNBC and others, they repeat the same narrative despite what their guts and their hearts are telling them. We recently saw Jake Tapper have some cognitive dissonance in real time on the air, talking to an Israeli official who refused to admit that they were not allowing Palestinians a safe exit. Journalists and those who are brave enough to deviate from the accepted narrative and tell the truth may face criticism or be marginalized. This can create an environment where journalists and media organizations self-censor to avoid negative consequences. Marcus Lamont Hill and Mehdi Hassan are two names that come to mind who both got fired for telling the truth about Palestine and having integrity in their journalism by not giving softball questions to those in power. Media often operates within a shared ideological framework that reflects the interests of powerful institutions. This can limit the range of acceptable discourse and shape the way that events are interpreted. We've all seen that creepy video with the newscasters all saying the same shit, right? The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common on, on social, social media. media. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. It's that, but political too, not just the weather or Beanie Baby reviews. Chomsky and Herman argued that these factors, among others, contribute to a media environment where consent is manufactured by shaping the information available to the public. Societies differ, but in ours, the major decisions over what happens in the society, decisions over investment and production and distribution and so on, are in the hands of a relatively concentrated network of major corporations and conglomerates and investment firms and so on. They are also the ones who staff the major executive positions in the government, and they're the ones who own the media, and they're the ones who have to be in a position to make the decisions. They have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way life happens, you know, what's done in the society. Within the economic system, by law and in principle, they dominate. The control over resources and the need to satisfy their interests imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and uh, the ideological system. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a grand conspiracy going on, but rather that systemic biases and dependencies can lead to a narrowing of the discourse in ways that serve the interests of the powerful elite. The conspiracy isn't behind closed doors so much as it is in our faces through coercion and doublespeak. When we talk about manufacturing of consent, whose consent is being manufactured? We, we can, to start with, there are two different groups. We can get more, into more detail, but at the first level of approximation, there's two targets for propaganda. One is what's sometimes called the political class. There's maybe 20% of the population, which is relatively educated, more or less articulate, uh, that plays some kind of role in decision-making. Uh, they're supposed to sort of participate in social life, either as managers or cultural managers, like, say, teachers and writers and so on. They're supposed to vote. They're supposed to play some role in the way economic and political and cultural life goes on. Now, their consent is crucial. It's one group that has to be deeply indoctrinated. Then there's maybe 80% of the population uh, whose main function is to follow orders and not to think, you know, and not to pay attention to anything. And they're the ones who usually pay the cost. Examples of manufactured consent in America can be identified in various historical and contemporary contexts, often involving the media, government, and corporate interests. Keep in mind that the term manufactured consent suggests a systemic process rather than specific isolated events. You cannot be coerced into something or believing something irrational without first being groomed to thinking that's okay. I want to talk about a few specific examples that I consider timely, including media coverage of political campaigns, corporate influence on news content, and coverage of social justice movements. 
During election cycles, media coverage can heavily influence public opinion. The way candidates are betrayed, the issues emphasized, and the framing of debates can shape public perception and affect voter choices. Critiques often highlight biases favoring certain candidates or issues. There is a reason, for instance, that mainstream media and the DNC alike keep showcasing the buffoonery of the Republican Party and their debates that devolve into elementary school name calling without giving us an open opportunity to primary Joe Biden and have a debate on the Democratic side. That's not against the rules. They are trying to manufacture our consent into voting for him for a second time. They show us their dysfunction to prop up Joe and say, see what you would have instead? Go for Joe. We'll finish the job. And can I say that that is such an interesting, and by interesting, I mean Patrick Bateman type of slogan to announce directly after being asked to grant a ceasefire in Palestine? Finish the fucking job? I ask, is that semantics or a declaration? I personally beg us all, especially us on the left, to start taking people seriously with what they say and do. As Maya Angelou said, When people show you who they are, believe them. Yes. Liberals on social media have been regurgitating the fear of Project 2025 from the DNC and mainstream media to manufacture our consent into voting for Joe Biden. You know, I keep seeing people on social media, especially those who are very, very far left, saying this. <sighs> For Biden in 2020. I have never liked him. And when I first heard that he was going to be the Democratic candidate, I said that I wasn't going to vote in 2020, but I felt like it was important and I felt like he was the lesser of two evils. And I still feel that. But after today, I cannot imagine voting for him in 2024. Because at this point, the lesser of two evils for whom? Yeah, this whole I'm not going to vote for Biden in 2024 is maybe one of the most selfish and insane strategies I've ever seen in politics. But look, if Donald Trump wins, I want every single person who went on social media and said things like this and encouraged their followers not to vote to do a couple things for me. Go to every single family who lost a child in a mass shooting and tell them, yeah, I didn't vote for Biden, even though he passed the first piece of major gun legislation in over 30 years and I let Trump win. Go to the little girls, the teenagers in Republican states who were assaulted and had to have their assaulter's baby and tell them, yeah, I didn't vote for Joe Biden, even though he's appointed pro-choice judges every single opportunity he's had. And I let Donald Trump, the guy who overturned Roe v. Wade win the presidency. Go to coastal towns around the country, especially where people are suffering from climate change and tell them, yeah, I didn't vote for President Biden who invested the most in fighting climate change ever. I let Donald Trump and his pro-fossil fuel agenda win. And then go to the seniors on Medicare who now have their insulin cap at $35 a month because of President Biden and tell them, yeah, I didn't vote for President Biden even though he passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which did that. And now Donald Trump is gonna come into office and undo all of that progress. Oh, and go to all the veterans who are exposed to toxic burn pits while serving abroad who now have more health care because of President Biden's PACT Act and tell them, yeah, Biden expanded your health care, but I didn't vote for him. And now Trump is going to undo that. Oh, and finally, go to all the Muslim Americans who are going to be deported under Donald Trump's new Muslim ban that he's been talking about in the past couple of days and say, yeah, I could have kept you guys here by voting for President Biden, but I didn't. I, I didn't vote at all. And Donald Trump got into office and now he's deporting all of you guys. So sorry. So genuinely, for this far left coalition of people who are like, I'm not going to vote for Biden in 2024. If Trump wins, you will be part of the reason why. You will be part of the reason why, and you'll have to answer to all the people who were affected by Trump's win and his terrible policy that he's going to implement. Many people, including myself, have declared our vehement disgust in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's presidency because of their apathy toward the American people, but ultimately and unequivocally because of their blatant support of the genocide in Palestine. It is not complacency, it is not ignorance, it is support. America has given Israel billions of dollars under their wall. America has gifted Israel many of the weapons that have killed or maimed someone in Gaza. I find the sort of browbeating that liberals keep trying to give leftists about voting for a genocide supporter in 2024 to be really funny. Because just from a purely logical standpoint, the idea that you are going to bully a huge portion of the Democratic like base into voting for a guy that they do not want to vote for instead of, I don't know, using the arms of democracy to like either find a new candidate who does not have these glaring issues in their campaign 
or bully the person that you already want to win into becoming like a better candidate. It is hundreds of thousands of people that you are now trying to convince to vote for a guy who does genocide rather than just telling the singular guy, hey, you're the leader of the free world. Can you stop supporting genocide? You can feel however the fuck you want about it. You can feel like we're selfish. You can feel like we are idiots or dumb. The reality is that if you want to depend on this strategy to win your elections, you are going to lose. So accept that reality and let's move on to start like changing the system. Beat those egg whites. When I say something like vote blue no matter who doesn't work, it didn't work in 2016 and it will ultimately secure another win for Donald Trump this election. People go crazy in my comments. People spam the old but project 2025. They say I don't understand harm reduction. They call me privileged for not voting for Biden even though I never said I wasn't gonna vote for Biden. They do everything except acknowledge that Joe Biden is currently tanking in the polls and is going to lose the election unless he changes his strategy and appeasing voters who are threatening not to vote for him will wonderfully improve his chances. And maybe, just maybe, calling disillusioned voters dumb, stupid idiots isn't going to win Joe Biden any election. It's honestly crazy how dogmatically protective of the liberal establishment some so-called leftists are. Refusing to entertain the interests of a large chunk of your party's voters under these conditions, regardless if Trump is running, is going to inevitably result in third party voting or no voting at all. If Biden loses, it's his own fault. He has a year to turn it around, and if he wants to actually do it, he needs to listen to his voters or step away and let someone else listen. That's not a privilege take, it's a realistic take. I want to eat that. Vote blue no matter who, right? Vote blue no matter who until they tell you that you are just as bad as white supremacists for being anti-Israel. Vote blue no matter who until your president backs a genocide with your tax dollars. If I was to bake a cake and a cake looks beautiful on the outside, it's got all this ganache, these strawberries, whipped buttercream frosting on the inside, it's even jelly. Like I just did my shit with that cake, right? Beautiful in theory until you take a bite out of it and realize I use salt instead of sugar. That's this political system. How long will you have to see it? Like, what do they have to do to y'all before you start to realize neither one of these parties give a fuck about you? Democrits and Republicans, bro. They're the biggest and most vile gang in America, and nobody has come close to their body count. When will y'all demand a new system, or are you too scared? Ecological warfare is working, right? That American dream? Which brings me to my next point. Y'all finna pay taxes, no taxation without representation, and most of us can't even vote, right? in jail for non-violent crimes like selling weed on the street even though they just open a dispensary down the street from your house and they got a weed tax right but you're in jail now you're a felon now you can't vote now you don't have access to public housing now you don't have access to education you are now a slave to the system but they gonna make sure they get them taxes out of you not really a citizen but they're gonna make sure you're a paying customer in this corporation that is america vote blue no matter who though right i'm not voting for biden no matter what okay so what's your plan i'm Ooh, black and brown people already have the answer. By organizing to structurally shift this country away from white supremacy in bigger ways than only focusing on voting and only focusing on shifting our system from a two-party to multi-party system. And that's by doing things like organizing to stop Cop City in Atlanta, and frankly, the numerous liberation movements led in this country by black and brown folks. The problem is, when black and brown people organize to shift this country away from white supremacy, our communities quite literally get bombed, like in 1985 when the entire city of Philadelphia was bombed because the United States wanted to take out a couple of members of black liberation movements, and more recently when the folks who've been organizing to stop Cop City have been labeled as terrorists. So as a white person who wants to be a part of the solution, the best thing you can do is talk to the brown and black people who are already doing this work to find out how your privilege can best be used. Biden, you trying to get elected in 2024? Good luck, Charlie. The name Genocide Joe isn't just a roast. It is a stain on his legacy forever. Beyond death, beyond the stardust, like Carl Sagan would say. I take this time to bring up third party candidates like Claudio Del Cruz and Dr. Cornel West. Yes, we need you to be part and parcel of wrestling with this corporate duopoly, this two party system that impedes, it gets in the way of the unleashing of the kind of policies of abolishing poverty and homelessness, of dealing with working wages, cutting back on militarism, and most importantly, 
trying to ensure that the best of who we are as a people can be more manifest, can be more concrete, because the crisis is real and these catastrophes are bombarding us. Please, come join us. We're not career politicians and we don't have billionaire friends. We're educators, community organizers, and mothers. You don't need to tell us that the working class makes this country run. I'm from the South Bronx and we know what hard work looks like. I know this country wouldn't last a day without the working class. So isn't it about time that we take charge? This campaign is for all of us living paycheck to paycheck or working multiple jobs. For all of us who are sick of watching the rich get richer while we can't even pay our rent. We don't just want to tax the billionaires, we want them out of power entirely. We need to seize big pharma, seize big tech, seize the big banks, instead of letting them run our government. We need an economy that puts the people before profit. An economy built to generate prosperity for everyone, not just a handful of billionaires. This campaign is not a one-time thing. We're running to build a political organization that finally gives voice to the working people of this country. It's time to stop going around in circles while the elites change places every four years. We think this country deserves a better option, a socialist option. If we truly are in a democracy, that I should be able to vote for whoever I want, whenever I want, however I want to vote for them. Why, liberal, is the fate of our democracy on my vote for someone who supports a genocide? Since you got your degree and you know every fucking thing. You do not have to wave Project 2025 around like a threat to any marginalized person. Fascism has already been here for us. Apartheid has already been here for us. And you all have not listened. We will struggle and we will survive, no matter the canon, like we always have. And it's up to you, liberal, to join us or not. Which side are you on? And while I haven't gotten into the nitty gritty of the differences between each campaign side by side, I endorse both candidates. I've known Dr. Cornel West since my childhood, as he's been a prominent leftist and black intellectual figure for many decades. He's a Marxist and has been on the front lines in every issue for as long as I can think back. And I genuinely mean that. Claudia Del Cruz is a socialist from New York City and an Afro Latinx mom and community organizer. Both, however, have such small social media audiences and have limited reach on mass media. I watched a video of Cornell West and Norma Finkelstein that should go viral. Dr. Cornell West, frankly, only gets invited because he's a tenure professor at Princeton. That gives him some sort of merit in the mainstream media's eyes, but both Claudia and Cornell need our support. Whether they win or not, our collective efforts in supporting them both, their messaging, and even campaigning for them through grassroots organization can help put Marxism on the map in America in a real way. Just like we did for Bernie in 2012 and 2016, we can shift the Overton window to the left. They need our help because they do not have the support of the mainstream media. They're easy to dismiss as spoiler candidates or people who are too unserious or too fringe. Our collective power together, however, can prove them wrong. I shared recently that a new video I'll be making in the future is about Emma Goldman. All countries are going fascist because of the world reaction of today. A war is very imminent and the munition manufacturers are trying to bring it about. And in the research that I've been doing in the last week or so, I've learned that we had an anarcho-communist force in America. I mean hundreds of thousands of people. That can happen again, but only if we organize. Conscious, becoming conscious is linked to mobilization and organization, something we mentioned last year. We must make clear distinctions between mobilizers and organizers. To be an organizer, you must be a mobilizer. But being a mobilizer doesn't make you an organizer. Much confusion is to be found here. Malcolm X was a great mobilizer. He was a great organizer. Martin Luther King was a great mobilizer. He was not a great organizer. These facts can be easily seen from King and Malcolm. When Malcolm went to a place, he left a mosque. When King went to demonstrations, he broke down desegregation and he moved on. The second example of modern manufactured consent is the corporate influence on the news. Media outlets are often owned by large corporations with diverse interests. The potential for conflicts of interest arises when media organizations report on topics that may impact their owners or advertisers. 
This can result in self-censorship or biased reporting. As mentioned before, we spoke about how media outlets are struggling with sharing the truth while also maintaining the messaging they are receiving from higher-ups. You can see this with CNN, for example, who has been doing double messaging in the last coming week. I primarily get my news from Democracy Now!, Al Jazeera, and similar independent news sources, but I will watch CNN and others just for temperature checks on the mainstream messaging and how they're showcasing things. And I've noticed, as well as a few others on social media, that they will share the messaging from their higher-ups that are clearly pro-Israel and pro-Israel government, but then share the truth on a smaller channel of theirs or at a less popular news hour. Liberals in general are in a reckoning, and they're stuck between a rock and a hard place currently. They are coming to grips with realizing that the truth and what we were all conditioned to believe, propaganda that we were all groomed under, but they fell for, hook, line, and sinker, is bullshit. We're seeing this with the double speak. It's cognitive dissonance. It's up to them, however, to do something about it, though, because complacency is also a choice. And as discussed before, being complacent in the face of fascism and genocide isn't actually complacency. It's silent support. Lastly, the media's portrayal of social movements such as the civil rights movement and protests against war can influence public opinion. Biased coverage may frame activists as extremists or downplay the legitimacy of their grievances. In this very moment, the government and the media alike are working in tandem to influence the uninformed masses who disagree with pro-Palestinian activists and their events. In London, for instance, they constantly have had free Palestine marches that have exceeded 100,000 participants on the regular, and the media in the UK are intentionally not covering it. The mainstream media in America did not cover the protests at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade or at the Christmas lighting at Rockefeller Center. There were thousands of people at both events, but your aunts, uncles, moms, and dads who only wanted watch ABC News saw nothing about it. The government also has been passing draconian and blatantly anti-speech bills that conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which so many Jewish comrades have explained puts Jewish people into more danger. How would you respond to the charge that anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism? Actually, the Locus Classicus, the best formulation of this was by uh, an ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Abba Evan, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, uh, in an article that he wrote about 45 years ago, which I urge you to read, uh, which appeared in an American Jewish journal, Congress Weekly, a major journal of the more liberal wing of the American Jewish community. He wrote an interesting article in which he, dis he was then UN ambassador from the state of Israel. He advised the American Jewish community that they had uh, two tasks to perform. One task was to show that criticism of the policy, what he called anti-Zionism, that means actually criticisms of the policy of the state of Israel were anti-Semitism. That's the first task. Second task, if the criticism was made by Jews, their task was to show that it's neurotic self-hatred needs psychiatric treatment. And he gave two examples of the latter category. One was I.F. Stone, the other was me. So we have to be treated for our psychiatric disorders and non-Jews have to be condemned for anti-Semitism if they're critical of the state of Israel. It's understandable why uh, Israeli propaganda would take this position. I don't particularly blame Abba Evan for doing what ambassadors are sometimes supposed to do, but we ought to understand it. There is no sensible charge. No sensible charge. There's nothing to respond to. It's not a form of anti-Semitism. It's simply criticism of the criminal actions of a state. Period. And, you know, sometimes you see people writing things that absolutely are anti-Semitic. I've also seen people watch a video where Hamas terrorism is condemned, where uh, uh, an, ob just an objective assessment of, a, of an issue is given or, or the, the dynamics of a situation are outlined, as well as an 
obvious condemnation of things like occupation, sieges, civilian casualties. And I've heard people say that that's an expression of anti-Semitism. And look, I don't know when people say that type of thing. I, I've met some people who genuinely are so emotionally disturbed or emotionally troubled that they do actually go there. And I don't understand the specific psychological issues around that. But I also know people who know perfectly well that there's no anti-Semitism and they use it as this cheap and disgusting parlor trick. And you are cheapening the legacy of genocide, exile, and exodus of the Jewish people. And you're cheapening the legacy of Jews who've been targeted in terrorist killings. And you're cheapening the legacy of people who've been victims of suicide bombings and assassinations in Israel and elsewhere because of their Jewish identity. It's disgusting. And it's time to start talking about Israel as a normal state, not held differently because it's Jewish in a bad light and not held and justified for everything because it's Jewish. It's a nation state with policies and priorities. And this government and many previous Israeli government have followed a policy of expanding settlements, depriving Palestinians of human rights, and serious Israeli analysts acknowledge what the situation is. You should too. Don't ever throw anti-Semitism out as a cheap, pathetic tactic to disrupt conversation on this vital issue. It's disgusting, it's disingenuous, it's pathetic, and you should stop. This conflation is why some businesses are cautious now about celebrating Hanukkah because they are now fearful that someone will assume that means being pro-Israel. Because we're Jews, it's being done in our name, we have to stand up and yell, it's not anti-Semitism to be against Zionism. On the contrary, we are attacked. Wherever there is a large Jewish community, wherever there's a very religious Jewish community, even if it's not large, they will be in opposition to the existence of the Zionist state of Israel because it is antithetical to Judaism. The U.S. government and Israeli government trying to manufacture our consent into believing that this genocide is justifiable. They're trying to manufacture our consent into believing being anti-genocide is bigotry and hatred against Jewish people. That it is a holy war. This is not a holy war. This is about white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Being informed about examples like this and manufacturing consent and its various factors, including ownership, economic interests, and political considerations, contribute to the shaping of public opinion in different spheres of American society. Once you really understand this concept, you'll start questioning everything. Did they manufacture my consent on how I feel about my neighbor, about black people, about queer people, about Muslim people? And the answer is yes. Analyzing media critically and seeking diverse sources of information is essential to understanding the complexities of these dynamics and can help you unlearn them. With practice, you will come to understand the differences between thoughts that you have formed in your own and the ones that were planted there by society's propaganda campaign. Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? In the beginning of this video, I spoke up about semantics and how they're actually very important, especially in the realms of politics and understanding propaganda. And I mentioned previously that it's, it is not about pretentiousness. At least it's not for me. We all know way too many leftist bros like to correct people to show off their intellect. But for me, it genuinely is about opening up people's minds and their perspectives. I want to take some time to really dissect why words matter and why you may catch me in the comments on a TikTok telling people that they're not leftists but they're liberals and getting into too many fights about it because I'm trying to explain why. <laughs> words mean things. It's also why I'm trying to focus more on YouTube because the lack of people's understanding of semantics causes to fights and I have a better chance of explaining my point uninterrupted in video format. <laughs> So let's get into it. Semantics, the study of meaning in language, is crucial in discussing politics for several reasons. Semantics helps ensure that political discussions are precise and clear. Using the right words and defining terms accurately helps to convey ideas with minimal ambiguity. This is essential for fostering a shared understanding among participants in political discourse. Political debates often involve complex and nuanced issues. Without attention to semantics, miscommunication and misunderstandings can and will arise leading to the distortion of arguments and positions. Just look at any comment section under a political TikTok video, for example. Clear and well-defined language helps prevent misinterpretations. The way political messages are framed significantly influences public perception. Uh, the point is that you have to work. 
And that's why, that's why the propaganda system is so successful. Uh, very few people are going to have the time or the energy or the commitment to carry out the constant battle that's required to get outside of, uh, you know, McNeil or, or you know, Dan Rather or somebody like that. The easy thing to do, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you've had a busy day, you know, you're not going to spend the evening carrying out a research project. So you turn on the tube and say it's probably right. You know? Or you look at the headlines in the paper and then you watch the sports or something. Because uh, and, and that's, that's basically the way the system of indoctrination works. Sure, the other stuff is there, but you're going to have to work to find it. Semantics plays a role in framing political issues positively or negatively. So these words do matter, and they matter a lot. Politicians and media outlets carefully choose words to shape the narrative, and understanding these linguistic choices is essential for critical analysis. For example, political speeches and rhetoric are powerful tools for this form of persuasion. Semantics helps individuals evaluate the rhetoric used by politicians and public figures. And analyzing the choice of words, tone, and underlying meanings can provide insights into the speaker's intentions and biases. In political discourse, propaganda may be employed to manipulate public opinion. Semantics helps individuals deconstruct propaganda by examining the language used, identifying loaded or emotionally charged terms, and understanding how certain narratives are constructed in the first place. Being up to date on semantics and the meaning of words in these political environments allows you to pick up on the more insidious dog whistles, like the ones that Joe Biden uses. Everyone can tell that Trump is bigoted, but when you start criticizing the DNC and the Democratic Party, that's where everyone loses their shit. They can't fathom that they could be doing evil also. Is it me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. Maybe I am. Am I the villain? I don't think I'm the villain. That once again shows that their semantics and propaganda campaigns are extremely effective. In politics, laws and policies are drafted with specific language to ensure clarity and precision or to intentionally confuse and cause dissent. The semantics of legal, Documents are crucial for avoiding loopholes, misinterpretations, and unintended consequences. Precision in language is especially important in legislative and policy-making contexts. A good example of how language can gatekeep communities or audiences from understanding or participating in it fully is corporate America and corporate American lingo. It is used as a weapon to force assimilation and as a test to judge willingness to conform. If you are a great worker at many of these larger institutions, but fail to conform to their language and their social identity, you are called out for not adapting to company culture. They do the same in politics. Constructive political dialogue requires a common understanding of terms and concepts. When participants in political discussions use semantics effectively, they can engage in more productive and respectful conversations, fostering an environment where diverse perspectives can be considered. When they use them to cause confusion and disagreement, which is what American politicians often do, it causes echo chambers. People are angry and righteously so, but don't fully understand why and where it should be pointed. Toward. Semantics is influenced by cultural and contextual factors. Understanding the cultural nuances of language is vital in a diverse and political landscape. Words may carry different connotations in various cultural or regional contexts, and sensitivity to these nuances is essential for effective communication. This particular fact, as an autistic person who needs things to make sense, really fucking irks me. It bothers me that in America, people assume liberal means left, where in every other country in the world, liberal would be considered conservative by our standards because they are using the actual definition of the word liberal in other governments. It's like how Republican means leftist in places like Ireland. It just reminds me of the audacity of America to be the only country to use inches and feet, for instance, and to call soccer, soccer. Like we just had to be different, like so bad. <laughs> 
Semantics can be crucial in holding political figures accountable for their statements and actions. Clear and precise language leaves less room for evasion or misrepresentation, making it easier for the public to assess the consistency and integrity of political leaders. Ambiguity leaves too much room for chaos. I personally believe, for instance, we have such a shit show on the left currently in America because there's so many people in our ranks that don't actually belong here. Hillary Clinton started calling herself left and a leftist and on the left to try to win over Bernie supporters. Since 2016, I've noticed liberals on media and in social media alike call themselves the left. The Republicans also use this to try to show the radical positions of Democrats, but both liberal Democrats and Republicans are using the words leftist, left, or radical in bad faith. They're not truly leftists. Hillary and the DNC say it so you don't give your vote to an actual real leftist like Cornell, Claudia, or Bernie. The Republicans say it to incite fear mongering. A good rule of thumb in general is not to adapt the language of your opponent when they are making bad faith arguments and statements. If you, a liberal, know that you are a Molotov cocktail throwing quarter of Karl Marx and think mutual aid is scary, please stop calling yourself a leftist. Embrace your liberal life and go on. Look, man, <laughs> look, man. <laughs> Nobody looking for your bitch ass. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you are a bitch. And it's okay to be a bitch. You could be James Baldwin. <laughs> Stop trying to be tough. I say that with love. Which camera? I'm right here. Yeah. You are a bitch. <laughs> Being aware of the nuances of language is key to navigating the intricacies of political communication. So let's get into what liberalism actually fucking means. So that the people who believe in it and support it can be accurate. And for those who who were caught in the crossfire of using liberal and leftist as synonyms will stop doing it. Liberalism is a pull. <laughs> Liberalism is a political and philosophical ideology that emphasizes individual rights, liberty, equality, and rule of law. It has its roots in the Enlightenment thinking period and emerged as a response to the absolute monarchies and the authoritarian rule prevalent in Europe in the 17th and 18th century. Liberalism encompasses a broad range of beliefs and has evolved over time, but some core principles include individualism and individual rights overall, supporting the rule of law, quality and not equity, support of government, limited access to government, democracy, free market capitalism, and most importantly in this instance, tolerance and pluralism. Liberal is often used to describe individuals and policies associated with the center left of the political spectrum in America. They are not on the left. In liberal ideology, tolerance of diverse beliefs and lifestyles matters overall, meaning you have to be be tolerant of those who even may cause you harm or others harm based on the principle that we are all valid and our beliefs matter and that they all have genuine merit. Some liberals take it even further and believe that every idea deserves a platform, no matter how harmful. You see this manifesting as ACLU supports neo-Nazis under the guise of supporting free speech rights for all Americans. Leftists, however, understand that you should not give a fascist a platform. Leftist is a political ideology that emphasizes on social equality, social justice, and a commitment to addressing economic and social inequalities. Leftist ideologies advocate for collective or government intervention in the economy, often in pursuit of reducing inequality and promoting the welfare of marginalized or disadvantaged groups. Leftism encompasses a range of ideologies and political movements like democratic socialists, Marxists, anarchists, and communists. Key features of leftism overall, however, include true economic equality, including social welfare programs, taxing the rich, and reparations. Leftists are social justice minded and include intersectional civil rights movements of all kinds, including queer rights, gender equality, and racial justice. Lef leftists unequivocally support labor rights movements and unionization, fair wages, safe conditions, and collective bargaining. Leftists believe res in restoring the environment, anti-imperialism, and are staunchly anti-capitalist. Whether they agree on theory or not, these are the things that are widely agreed upon for all true leftists. We have infighting for how to get these things done and why, but we have unity surrounded by what being a leftist means. It is an intentional choice in our words. It is a declaration and a resistance against what we are currently doing in our system now. So to allow liberals to continue to identify with leftism is to water down our revolutionary stance. Leftism and liberalism are terms that are sometimes used interchangeably, but they represent distinct political ideologies with some key differences. Power struggle, 
a rapper, wrote a song called Prolet's Anthem that explains the difference between leftists and liberals perfectly. No more reform, what a revolution, cause everybody knows that's the real solution. We don't want reform, we want a revolution. We don't want reform, we want a revolution. We don't want reform, we want a revolution, cause everybody knows that's the real solution. We don't want reform, we want a revolution. I wrote this next part while listening to Gil Scott Heron, and I think this would be a good note to end on. Liberals want to reform the system as it stands. Leftists want to build something new. Leftists want to seize the means of production. Liberals want mixed economies and free market principles. Leftists know why people are homeless. It was built this way. Liberals donate to their local nonprofit or go to a soup kitchen once a year to absolve their guilt. Leftists start community fridges in their neighborhoods. Leftists want to abolish capitalism in favor of a more collectivist economic system and do so by participating in mutual aid. Liberals accept the ex existence of the capitalist system and believe regulation will prevent abuses and ensure fairness. Leftists understand power corrupts. Liberals believe diversity and power will make corruption easier to digest. Leftists believe in loud disruption and social justice by any means necessary. Liberals want us to figure out how to protest politely without discomfort to them or anyone else. Leftists know that agitation leads to change. Liberals believe we can vote our way out of fascism. Leftists understand that if we are in a position where we are being told we are voting fascism out, that fascism is already here. So who are you? Where do you want to be? What do you want to say? How do you want to be remembered? Thanks for watching, y'all. Uh, this is something I woke up... I mean, I wrote the outline of this in a couple paragraphs of it uh, a couple weeks ago, but I woke up this morning of the day of recording. It is the 10th of December, 6 a.m., and I wrote from 6 to 10 and finished this because I want to make sure that I am putting out stuff regularly even though my work-life balance is non-existent. I still want to make sure the things that I'm thinking and saying regularly in my diary, in my <laughs> Google Docs is being spread. Um, I think these are things that we should really be thinking about. The meaning of words. Um, my grandmother was an English teacher and that's why I really do love semantics semantics and linguistics um, because words are powerful and they mean a lot um, and it's not like I said in the video it's not about being better than someone else or being smarter than someone else it's, it's about being accurate the more accurate we are with our language the more accurate we can be in spreading our message so I will probably make a survey on my community page but I'm curious to know what video y'all would like to see next would you like another revolutionary women video? Or would you like law and order and copaganda finally? I've been writing that one. It's gonna be a doozy, but I would rather focus on that one if that's what you want. I don't know, let me know. I'm rambling at this point. Also, I wanna say thanks to everyone for making it to 2,100 followers. This is crazy, this is awesome. I love you guys. This is great. Peace. It goes beyond Alabama, it goes beyond Harlem. What is it revolting against? An international Western power structure. Another album, an amalgam of the anger, the message presented just like a prayer. Passion, dedication to tell a story. Can't rely on the media to do it for me. Crowd